help women save lives and peacefully end abortion where you live. I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, The infant would be delivered. Uh, The infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, The infant would be resuscitated if if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. You were serious about that? Be inspired to change hearts and minds by joining over one million volunteers taking part in the global movement happening in your neighborhood. She says, hi, that I can get through this abortion. And I said, oh, no, no. So she went ahead and went into the abortion clinic. And she just came out. She told me, I'm not going to get the abortion. We just had a baby shaved. But we had a baby shaved in Memphis today. Praise the Lord. This is the 40 Days for Life podcast with your host, Sean Carney. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the 40 Days for Life podcast. I am Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life and your host for this podcast, which is dedicated to helping you end abortion where you live. We are just now a couple of weeks. The day that this podcast comes out is a week before Valentine's Day, St. Valentine's Day. Um, So we are now two weeks from the kickoff of the spring campaign on Ash Wednesday, February the 22nd. Find your location, find your CVS or Walgreens location. Also, we've added a lot of those campaigns. So we are very excited about that unfortunate new opportunity that uh, CVS and Walgreens will be now dispensing the very dangerous RU46 abortion pills. So Lots to choose from at 40daysforlife.com between surgical abortion centers, Planned Parenthood referral centers, and now pharmacies as the drama of a post-row America unfolds. And that is what we are going to cover today as Mark, Mark Hauk, the 40 Days for Life volunteer who had his house raided by the FBI one and one big in court. And we are going to give you the details of that, uh, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and why this was such an important case. We've talked about this uh, a lot. It has huge ramifications, uh, whether he was found guilty uh, or whether he was uh, cleared of both counts, which he was. He was acquitted. So uh, we're thankful for that. I want to say before we, I bring you know Steve and Matt on, just sort of the obvious, we're going to get into details uh, of, of Mark's case and all of that, uh, some of which are, are funny, what happened in the courtroom. <laughs> um, you, you will not have more confidence in our federal government after this podcast, but just how outrageous this was. And to me, I think that the, the raid, first off, the non-incident incident, which the DA didn't press charges on, then the FBI out of nowhere, ignoring his his lawyers, Mark saying, if you're charging me with a face act, I'll turn myself in, ignoring them, and then raiding his house, and then going to court and realizing there was no there there. I think from the get from from the very beginning, this was the most outrageous thing I have ever encountered legally in the pro-life movement. I mean, you look at what the rescuers went through, you look at uh, big legal issues that have to do with abortion, abortion doctors getting shot, um, abortion clinics getting bombed. There are arrests that people understand and are like, oh, that's why they're doing that. That's why the feds are doing that. That's why the feds are investigating. And with Mark, there was just nothing at any point. And there had to be a guy or a gal in the meeting saying, I don't know if we should raid his house. (laughs) He has seven kids. He has no criminal record. And this isn't a banana republic. And it's just the most surprising, outrageous legal issue I have ever heard of. Maybe there's one that I'm forgetting. And a lot of y'all have been in the pro-life movement longer than I've been alive. So email it to us at podcast at 40daysforlife.com. But Mark's story sounds like we're making it up to show that we're being persecuted as a movement. It it sounds like pro-life propaganda. The FBI doesn't raid your house because of some like small altercation that happens in some vicinity of an abortion facility. Stop with all your drama. And yet that's exactly what happened. And the whole thing is pitiful. I'm glad he won. 
I'm glad that the FBI and the DOJ got a well-deserved embarrassment. It was earned, and I hope they leave us alone. My fear is that they won't, but I hope that they do. And uh, we are going to stay on top of this. And I know we're going to break it down, but it's okay to just be sitting in your house or listening in your car going, the whole thing is stupid. And it is. It, it was from the start. It was through the process. It was outrageous. They raided his home. He is going to sue the FBI. He recently announced that. We'll get into that. He should. And I think most Americans will be, you know, his biggest cheerleaders. Um, but the whole thing was outrageous. And I think it's the most outrageous legal thing I've ever encountered in the pro-life movement. And so uh, a little bit of a rant to start off with the obvious point of this whole case before we uh, break it down in a very calm, entertaining manner. So uh, joining me uh, on this podcast as it is released one week before Valentine's Day, and I can just feel big plans being made in the Madison, Wisconsin area as Steve Carlin prepares to spoil his wonderful wife in a week on Valentine's Day. Steve, happy early Valentine's Day. That, that's next week. That's, I guess, I thought the, the groundhog saw a shadow. On... Did you ever put a Christmas tree up? Let me, I need a backup because holidays, <laughs> you're a weirdo with holidays. We've talked about that uh, a lot on the podcast that we've had to. So you acknowledge that Christmas happened, right? Did you ever Christmas actually happened. put it? And there was a tree in your house. There was, there was until like Friday. I've, I've enjoyed as much Christmas as I can stand at this point. You went through the presentation February 2nd? Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. Most people obviously know that it's Groundhog Day, which is, I think, really creepy when you watch the footage of those guys in Pennsylvania with the groundhog. But uh, it's a funny Bill Murray movie. But uh, that's the feast of the presentation of the Lord where he's presented in the temple. And, and traditionally, that's kind of the end of Christmas. So good job. You stuck out till February the 2nd. And then now you look up, you have no clue what's ahead because you were so late to Christmas. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and, and when the groundhog saw a shadow, I thought that bought me some time on Valentine's Day. Is that not how it works? <laughs> no, no, not at okay. all. So, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, live dangerously here then. How about you? What do you what, have going on? We, our first year of marriage, Mary Lisa and I were like, we're married. We're doing the whole Valentine's Day thing. And we made reservations at a very crowded not so great restaurant in College Station. Uh, we went, we were actually seated next to uh, two board members uh, who were married. That was just uh, ironic. And so that was kind of funny. Um, and we had dinner and it was crowded and it was expensive and we never did it ever again. So now we cook a nice dinner with our kids and that's our Valentine's Day. We don't leave. What about you? We, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, as I just mentioned that we just got out of Christmas mode. So I am in, I'm in some like real trouble here. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It's sound not like looking good. Whole... It's not looking good. Well, Send you... your suggestions to podcast at 40 days for If you can think of a way to bail me out of this dilemma really quick. You've got to buy flowers and you've got to buy chocolates. Uh, I'm yeah. pretty staunch about that. And these, I think if women say, oh, you don't get me any flowers on Valentine's, that's just so cliche. They're lying. Yeah, that's even I know not. not to tread on that ground. That's that's a bad move. And of course, it's better on a random Tuesday in June to swing into the grocery store and buy your wife flowers just for being a great wife. That's the best, right? But it's it's mandatory, the base level Valentine's Day, you're buying flowers and, and that was it. So- <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, Sean, we're we're Catholic and you're required to give up meat during Lent, which is quickly approaching on Fridays, but they always say that's the starting point. I think I think that's the same thing oh. with flowers and chocolate on Valentine's Day. Like you you probably better do more to be a good husband than that, but that's that's the bare bare minimum barely passing that's a, grade. That's a good analogy and I have five daughters, three boys. So I buy the girls one rose. And as tradition has unfolded, because the first time I did it, I was like, what do I get Seamus? You know, he's the only boy. He was like two. So I was checking out with the flowers for Mary Lisa and the individual roses for my little girls. 
And so I'm in the checkout line. I'm like, what would I get Seamus? What will he like? And I see a bag of Cheetos. So I grab the Cheetos. And so every year I buy the girls flowers and I buy my son's Cheetos. And um, the boys are considered the winners. I mean, in their own minds, for sure. No doubt. So, okay. Speaking of winners, uh, Mark Hawk won big in court. And so obviously for this podcast, we are going to bring the first lawyer who talked to Mark whenever this original incident happened in October of 2021. And that was our wonderful very own general counsel, Matt Britton, who joins us from Montana. Matt, how are you? Great. Fantastic. Sitting here in God's country, looking over about two foot of powder it's getting up to 37 and sunny today. It's going to be in the low 30s all week and um, just just beautiful. It's and, a good week uh, with Mark winning. You gave a huge long introduction and then you covered like every base in your introduction. And then <laughs> I did and that. then and then you talked to Steve for 10 minutes about I don't know, it was a galloping thing of his psychoses at highest level and uh I don't know. I just feel, I feel like the expert who came on to talk about T2 and you guys, and I have, I have nothing to, and you're like, what do you think about T2? And I'm like, oh, it was released in 1992. And it was yeah. cool. Thank you. <laughs> it was 1991. Uh, but yes, uh, we could easily talk about T2. Um, by the but way. But yes, I was the first lawyer, um, according to Mark, uh, that got the call back when the original charges were had. And then um, he got the target letter from the, uh, FBI. I mean, um, and DOJ. Since we're going to drop some of these names, so that was the process. They called Matt. Matt got in touch with our good friends at Thomas Moore. And Thomas Moore hired a local uh, but nationally known established trial lawyer who was Brian McDonagall. Am I saying that McMahon. right, Matt? McMahon. Um, McMonahan. Um, and he carried out most of the trial, and we're going to get into the details, but this guy is a well-known attorney. He's a killer, and he won big, and he absolutely mopped the floor um, with some of the, uh, with his cross-examinations. A few things I, I mentioned in that rant before we open, I want to mention a couple of just funny things. There was a little bit of like the dog ate my homework uh, from the feds on this. They claimed to have this video of Mark you know, doing this horrible thing. And when he was, when the FBI agent was on the stand, he actually, he just said, oh yeah, I lost the video. <laughs> like, like that was it. Like he raided the guy's house. We're all here. There were a couple of moments like that where you were just completely unimpressed with our, our with the, the U S attorneys. And Matt, you said going in uh, it's either, or there are some very gifted, very talented U S attorneys. Thank God. That's what we want. We just want them focusing on sex traffickers and drug lords and not pro-life volunteers who don't do anything. But um, this was not a good look for the FBI or the prosecutors whatsoever. I mean, I really I don't know where to even start on um, the whole issue because it's very hard to for people who don't spend their life in court, as I have um, or or on the prosecution side, it's just, it's hard to understand. Everybody knows, you don't need to go to law school to know um, sort of three types of law, criminal law, employment law, and getting in a car wreck, right? Because everybody know, drives a car or knows someone who's been in a car wreck. Everybody's had a job and, and has been fired or has quit. And everybody um, knows somebody who got charged with a crime. In fact, usually uh, seven out of the 10 highest rated television shows on TV are crime shows. And you know the difference between stealing and borrowing, right? You don't need to go to law school. You need to know the difference between defending yourself, defending yourself and beating someone up. Well, that's really what this just came down to. And that's why you just need a trial dog, uh, a, a, a street trial lawyer that is very bright, but, and has very high skills is at the top of his or her game. And um, that's why you, you hire the best defense attorney. Um, for the best results and you hire the best prosecutors. Most great prosecutors go on to other things. You know, within two years of the OJ trial, which many of you remember personally, but certainly all of you have heard of, none of the attorneys on either side were practicing law. They were all media hounds. And so 
you know, being a trial lawyer is, is tough. It's deadlines. It's everything you say. There's one or two or three people on the other side objecting. There's a man or woman in a black robe sitting up there with ultimate authority saying, go faster. We've already heard that. Don't call that witness. No, you're wrong. Why? And, you know, it takes a toll. So your burners have to be on high. You got to be at the top of your game. You got to know evidence. You got to know local law. You got to be respected by the clerks and the court. And you got to know juries. And juries are convinced by three things, facts, numbers, and common sense. They don't want to be told what to do. And bad lawyers, and mainly those are government lawyers and cheesy defense attorneys and, uh, you know, the ambulance chasers that you hear about, they're the ones that go and they tell the jury what to think, you know, and, and that's not the job. The jury is to decide what the facts were credibly, apply the law to it, and come out with a verdict. And that's what happened. Praise be to God. And I mean that praise be to God, because you have to ultimately put your reliance in God that there will be 12 men and women who will fairly judge the facts and apply them fairly to the law. And, um, you know, when Mark first uh, contacted me about this case, uh, he wasn't charged. The, um, the situation was, was that he and this guy had gotten into it uh, before they, uh, this pro abort uh, complainant guy. And uh, there were other incidences and this had nothing to do with abortion. This guy was abusing Mark and his son as usual. And, um, and, and Mark um, shoved him. And the cops didn't even charge it. And then um, the went, guy went and got his own warrant. And that was dismissed as, as maybe it should have been. Maybe it shouldn't have been. I don't know. But I'm not the judge. I wasn't there. It was dismissed by the Philly courts. Uh, it's just a little misdemeanor. Two men on the street, right? I mean, how many? I was an elected DA for four terms. We call them Commonwealth Attorney in Virginia. You know, and... Uh, how many thousands of cases did I analyze? This is a misdemeanor two men getting in an argument, you know, and or and uh, in any event got dismissed. And then this guy, um, the feds sent us sent him a target letter, and that's when I got involved again. And then uh, we actually sent Sean, and this is just critical. I don't know what this came out in the trial, but um, we actually sent the assistant U.S. attorney a letter. And I teamed up with Thomas Moore, and we got a former assistant U.S. attorney to sign the letter and send it with a like a little brief explaining why Mark wasn't guilty, saying, hey, if if you're going to charge this guy, we, we can turn him in, you know, but don't charge him because he's not guilty of this. And if you do charge him, you're not going to win. They just blew it off. They blew off um, our efforts to contact them. They blew off his own counsel. They blew off his own. I mean, you would think that the government, and when I was DA, if I got a lawyer letter saying I'll turn my guy in, the sheriff and I rejoiced, right? Because we didn't have to spend the resources, endanger young men and women with guns and uniforms going out there who may get in an altercation. And then we arranged the bond, and it was an orderly thing. You know, the orderly transition of power is why America has succeeded for so long. The orderly transition of power. And this is 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 how things are done. You know, when the judge says you're guilty, 99.9999% of the time, you shake your head and disagree, but you go off with the deputy. You don't run out the front door and become a fugitive, right? And so it, when your lawyer calls you up as a former assistant U.S. attorney, a member of the bar and says, let's talk about this, and you won't even talk. I mean, what are we in kindergarten? No, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to send my friends to beat you up. And then, you know, that's that's essentially what happened. So I'd like to know what who authorized this? Yeah. I mean, the guy already got it charged and acquitted. So typically, if it, if it was the same thing, uh, Sean, then the, the U.S. attorney himself in this case would have had to waive what's called the Pettit policy of the United States of America. So if you stood on the banks of... Um, Missouri and shot someone across the Mississippi who was standing in Illinois. That's that's a crime in Missouri. It's a crime in Illinois, and it's a federal crime across state lines, right? If you are tried and, and acquitted or convicted in Missouri, then Illinois can do it. And if you're tried and convicted in both of them, the feds can do it. Seems like double jeopardy, but it's not. Each of those sovereigns, it's called the separate sovereign doctrine. But why? Like, in order to for the federal government to step in after the state has already prosecuted for the same or similar offense, there's something called the Pettit policy. I'd like to know who waived that because Pettit policy needs to be waived by the attorney general. So there's a lot in the background here about why it happened. That's why I said I don't know where to start. But we do know that he got charged and dismissed on a state level, and that should have been the end of it. 
and then he got charged in the investigated and he should have never been charged in the federal level. Obviously, he was acquitted. Uh, you're supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, the prosecutor is supposed to ethically have probable cause that they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt all of the charges. And these but were the, just the, ridiculous. The, the raid, like the former FBI agents and a few current ones, the raid is what's surprising. The raid is like, he's a flight risk. He's going to run. And there's something there. The local it's, DA. It, like, who does it, Sean? Right. You know, if I had gone to the sheriff, it, like, it's like, where were all the good Germans, right? <laughs> I mean, where are the agents going? But this guy has no record. He has a bunch of kids. Why are we showing up in the middle of the night? But they had, they had to be there. They had to oh, be there. They, they are. Told to they show are. Up. When, when I would, you know, go in and say, we want to serve this warrant, high risk warrant, you know, with the SWAT team. And the sheriff didn't. We argued about it behind closed doors and we made a decision. Right. And we didn't send the SWAT team, but in, in a, in a, in a very, you know, drug dealers, people known to have guns, violent people, multiple felony convictions for violence, flight risks, non-citizens, which used to be a crime, uh, who had crossed into our border illegally, all that stuff. But we r rarely argued, but the deputies, the SWAT team commander, uh, in our case, a former SEAL team four guy would say, this just doesn't warrant it. Like, what are we doing? We're just going to stand there and, you know, there's this guy committed a, uh, and this was happening, um, you know, in these election fraud cases as well. So it's obviously politically motivated. Yeah. And um, so who authorized the federal warrant? Why didn't they respond to our letter? Uh, why did they find probable cause? And why did they have to arrest him at gunpoint? Why didn't they just call his lawyer, a former U.S. attorney, and say, yeah, turn your guy in, we're charging him? So, is it fair see, to ask too? How did they even find out about it? This is a local thing, a little shoving match that goes on. I can understand. Okay, somebody gets mad and calls the police. I've never known a human being that's went and called the FBI. Like, wh what's the chain that leads you that's from? That's a good question, Steve. I I don't know uh, whether or not this um, complainant called the FBI or whether or not you know he he's a bona fide volunteer for the Planned Parenthood. By the way, and this came out. Uh, which was another embarrassment for the feds in court uh, because the, the, the viewer or the listener is probably like, well, it's probably Planned Parenthood. You know, they want to intimidate all pro-lifers and you would think that, but Planned Parenthood doesn't approve of their volunteers getting into scuffles and insulting people's kids. So they actually prevented him from ever volunteering ever again for them. They got rid of him and that came out in the course, in the course of the, the protesters, of the, 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 the protesters, meaning these guys, the 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 yelling and screaming guys, the people who dress up in silly costumes and have bullhorns, not us. That's who Planned Parenthood. They publicly said that doesn't want. That's what drives down business. That's what gets the zoning official to come out and not give them a building permit. That's what gets the neighbors to say, "Move out of my neighborhood." It's not forty days for life. Silently uh, and and prayerfully and peacefully and lawfully praying. You're exactly right. But um, you know, no one knows. Although Sean. At this very location, or certainly in Philadelphia, <clears throat> we have had a different situation where we know um, that the abortion facility has planted people in order yep. to uh, drum. So who knows, Steve? Um, we should be able to find that out through now that the case is over through uh, FOIA, Freedom of Information. I don't know whether Mark's going to do that. Certainly, if there is a um, if there is a civil suit that will come out in what's called discovery, the depositions, the document requests and things like that. Of course, the government will circle the wagons and then claim that they are being open about it because Joe Biden's allowing his beach house to be searched. Yeah. You know, and oh, you'll be yeah. like, what does that have to do with anything? But but it is yeah. a, 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 a oh, what a tangled weave, web we weave, right? The government has woven such a tangled web. You, you almost think they're doing it on purpose so that nobody can figure out where the spider is. Exactly. And there's there's two things, I think, on, on the raid. Number one, totally unnecessary. The guy has no record. I'm sure there were agents going, we're like driving out to the guy's house. He's got seven kids. It's six o'clock in the morning or whatever. They're like walking up and he's got the statue of the Virgin Mary in his yard. You're like, I, I just... I like carrying around my AR-15, but I'm not sure it's necessary. So there's that part that it's not necessary. Well, let me comment on that, Sean. Let me give you something that you a normal, not a layperson wouldn't think of. Yeah, there is a reason to carry an AR-15 when you go to someone's home. 
but there's not when he's just like walking down the street from Panera Bread. They actually made it more dangerous by going to, a, 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 you know, a person's home is their castle. Most people are privileged to have, we- I, I, I have no idea, weapons in their home. They can defend a home and often do. But, you know, Mark, go like he goes to work. He, he goes, goes out and gets store. gas in his car. He walks the dog. They could have done this a million other ways that were safer. In other words, they created their own hostile environment. It's like saying, well, we had to have shields and vests and guns and automatic weapons and rooftop snipers because people have guns in their home. Well, why didn't you just arrest them at the gas station? Oh, yeah. That those are the types of things that fair-minded, reasonable, objective law enforcement officials talk about. Remember when I said I argued with the sheriff? I'd be like, oh, man, this is going to be dangerous. We better send in the SWAT team. He'd say, well, Matt, I'm just going to get some when he's walking a dog. <laughs> and he would. But yeah, <laughs> and then he'd just walk up to him and say, come on with me. He'd go, okay. But but the, the, there's that side of it. It's totally not uh, necessary. But also the optic, which I know – the optic is what they wanted. I know, which is the intimidation. And factor. when they get that's sued, it's going to crush them. Crush them because you raided the guy's house to sit in front of his family. In front of his family. Knowing they were there. Don't tell me there was no surveillance. And all the comments about we don't have a SWAT team because they don't call it a SWAT team. All of that. It, it's bad. I mean, I I know there there are some in the FBI that think and believe some some heads need to roll. I mean, people need to get fired for this total embarrassment of an agency. Well, they should, but is. incompetence is a, is a, is a hallmark of qualification for the federal government now, not not to get dismissed. You know, people who aren't doing their job just keep their head down. That's always been the way in the federal government. You can keep your job, but people who are actively not doing their job, failing, losing, causing harm, um they don't even get dismissed. Yeah, it's just it's it's Pretty outrageous what happened. Somebody should be disciplined uh, or terminated. And why would if think if you were the U.S. attorney, if you have your assistant U.S. attorneys, or just if you were the district, you know, chief, and you find out that a former U.S. attorney is representing someone and you didn't even bother to answer their calls, you know, like Steve works for you. If 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 you get ten complaints from people that Steve just not responding. By the way. I make fun of Steve a lot. He's one of the best communicators in the world. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> yes, but, but that would never happen. So this is completely fake, unlike his hatred of Christmas trees, which is totally real. <laughs> and totally uh, real. So, yeah. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't just at the basic level, but it's so dysfunctional. It's so big. But in the end, it's proven itself to be a political animal. This is why I tell everybody, Sean, what's the most important law in the United States? What's the most important amendment? Everybody says first amendment. Some people argue, no, the second amendment, because it protects all. No, the fourth amendment, because they can't come into my house with that. No, it's the 14th amendment that all of the laws apply equally, the equal protection clause to everybody. Everybody matters or nobody matters. If some people can walk down the street and just get a letter, turn yourself in, and some people get arrested by the FBI just because, then no law matters. Steve, when this happened, and we we kind of mentioned this, but we didn't harp on it, but there was, when Mark's house got raided, and you're like, there really was no reason. I mean, did I get into an altercation two years ago? You know, every all 40 Days for Life volunteers thought, maybe they're going to uncover that Mark is like, funneling heroin into our country from the border and that's the gotcha moment which is why sometimes the feds do this local da throws it out and and they're like no there's something bigger here and they go in and they do that of course that never happened so the whole thing was dumb but steve for all of our volunteers i think it's such a great moment that the system actually worked we thought he was totally innocent and that the thing was absolutely outrageous and that played out beautifully and at times comically in the actual trial. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's why we're seeing so many people signing up to lead this campaign is because it's one thing where we at 40 Days for Life say to our leaders and to our volunteers, we've got your back. It's another thing when you can see it in the headlines, not just of you know pro-life media, but of, of mainstream national media that, okay, we said we had their back and we had their back. It's a big 
deal. And I, you know, there's a book out there, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it basically makes the case that the average American unwittingly commits like three felonies a day. The idea is there are so many laws out there that, gosh, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to collect rainwater in this barrel in my house. And that, that's a felony and who knew about it. And the idea, I guess, is that, you know, now that we've got these political prosecutions, you you look and you find, okay, we want to get this guy because he's pro-life. What can we find that he did and set an example for everybody? And so I think this is a great vindication for all pro-life leaders, for all pro-life volunteers to know, okay, they can't just come out there and get me for made up. I think you've been using the phrase trumped up charges, Sean. It, it's wonderful. And I've already been getting feedback about how the verdict is leading to more people hitting the sidewalks than were hitting the sidewalks before that verdict came out. Matt, will if Mark sues them and wins, which I think both of those are going to happen, um, you know, after the IRS scandal, it's the last time that there was this public misuse of a government agency. Obama was using the IRS to target conservative groups, pro-life groups. We were part of that. I would, I had filed the five hundred one c three for forty days for life, and. I mean, I was getting calls at 1230 at night from the IRS agent. Um, it was, You're talking about the admission under the Obama administration that yes. the IRS was targeting pro-life groups and trying to get them in trouble for these esoteric laws that Steve's talking about. You didn't sign in blue ink, therefore you lose. Yes, and they Correct. purposefully and, did it. Yep. And Congress went after him, one of the few good things that Paul Ryan did. And we handed all of our stuff over to Paul Ryan. I was interviewed by his office. I sent him all of our documentation and they won. It was a big embarrassment for the IRS. And there was kind of this slapping them on the wrist and then they kind of go away, um, like stop doing this. Will that happen with the FBI? I mean, if- Yes, you, you're not gonna, I, it's too big. To, you know, there used to be that IBM was too big to fail and, um, or AT&T, I forget what, what it was, you know, it's too big to fix. And uh, this is why people, um, the, the IRS got bigger. And now Biden is going to hire like 58,000 more agents or something ridiculous. Um, and, and they're passing laws not to go after people who accidentally like didn't pay $10 in taxes like Steve's talking about. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Sean, that um, politi politicization, politicization of the um, uh, America is we, we have a partisan system, right? So you have you have political philosophy, but you have political science, and that that politics is partisan by nature. That's okay, but weaponizing the mechanisms of government, which result in loss of freedom, and loss of family, and loss of fortune, uh, is absolutely outrageous. And that is what is going on. You know, you said the latest. Um, actually, I think the uh, the Russia uh, thing and the and the steel dossier and all was the latest, but the and and the biggest. Uh, but the biggest in scope was the IRS, and they they got caught, and nobody cared. It was like the IRS got bigger. They did stop doing it though, and uh, and right. that's one thing. And Canada took notice of all people, um, and uh, and 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 they are making sure. So the internal watchdogs uh, are very important, uh, but they just by executive order get rid of them. Um, and both sides do it. I'm not saying one side doesn't do it and one side doesn't do the other. What has not happened before in my lifetime, in my knowledge, is that the president um, and be, the president, meaning the executive branch, the DO, the people ex execute. So we have three branches, right? Legislatures make the laws. The judges judge what the laws mean and whether they apply. And the executive branch, the president, executes the laws. That's the same word, executive, execute. They, they put them into action. And he, the DOJ is run by the president. So when I say the president, I mean the executive branch. They have weaponized this, and they're going after certain people and not after other people, and they're declaring that. You know, you've, we've seen that. They admitted, um, the, the FBI director admitted. Yeah, some things are looting, and some things aren't. Women. Not depending yeah. on the action, but depending on who's doing it and why, and they get to choose, right? So, and they're doing it, and they have a pro-reproduction task force. They don't have a pro-life task force. And these things are outrageous, and that has never happened, and they're weaponizing it. They they weaponized it, uh, apparently, against Donald Trump to search Mar uh, for documents, and now they're searching the documents for the President of the United States while he's sitting in office. Like, what's going on here? Um, so, um, the point is, is that, yes, Mark, I didn't know until you told me before this program, I did communicate with him recently, um, is going to sue the U.S. Uh, apparently. And you can do that for certain reasons. Generally, they're immune, but you can sue under the Federal Torch Claims Act and you can sue under 
believe it or not, the civil rights color of authority, 42 yeah. USC 1983, which is it is acting under color of authority uh, and taking away another person's civil right. And, you know, Sean, he's if they went there with no other reason than to, than to throw fear and intimidation into him, his family and every other freedom loving person in the United States. Right. Because if Mark had been convicted, that would have put a chill on people who like hot dogs better than hamburgers who got in a fight and, and yeah. the Packers better than the Redskins and everybody in the world. Um, or me, because I said Redskins, like, <gasps> is, is Biden going to arrest me, you know, and because and all that, right. But now what Steve said is so important, they should be chilled. And that's what you're asking, Sean, is was the IRS chilled? Yes, they were. Yeah, but they're getting bigger. And we have a small like Congress is elected every two years. They don't care. I think AO. See, thought there were three houses of Congress. She was 28 or whatever. When she got, I mean, come on. People don't know. People don't know. In the pandemic in 1918, the Spanish flu, the people stormed the mayor of Denver's mansion because of the mask mandate. Nobody remembers that. Nobody does. <laughs> We're just, it's, which is though everything's brand new. And, and Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle never existed. You know, they, they thought of pretty much all of this stuff. And by the way, it's all in the Bible everything. There is nothing new under the sun. Check out Ecclesiastes. But yes, he has the right to sue under certain circumstances. Under most circumstances, the prosecutors are immune, are immune, but they can sue under this 42 USC 1983 action. And this is what law enforcement officers fear most, a 1983 action under color of authority. I can't tell you how many cops came and said, man, Matt, am I going to lose my house if we lose this case? Mm. These guys might. One of the great things that came out in the trial that I didn't expect, because you don't know how these things are going to go, and they're typically very just facts and to the point and secular, but really the beautiful nature of the mission of the pro-life movement and certainly the mission of 40 Days for Life and going out and sidewalk counseling and all that, the, the positive side of that, the fact that we are compassionate to the women who are leaving after an abortion, the fact that we really do offer medical alternatives to women going in for an abortion, the fact that so many women in Philadelphia with Mark and certainly across the country choose life and are very grateful and that our disposition and our attitude is, is positive and built on love, that came out in the trial. That came out in the trial. I even think the guy that was the original accuser said, you know, that he never doubted that Mark had pure intentions and good intentions. So that- And, and frankly, what... one of the incident instances, which led to count one, which is a misdemeanor, uh, Sean, was not on tape. That's the one, the FBI agent actually didn't lose the tape. It was the, they tried to get it and, and, and the uh, facility couldn't find the tape. Um, but magically- Well, Planned Parenthood lost the tape. Right, right. Okay, so, so yeah, he, he said they lost it. Yeah, so, but in any event- um, uh, yeah, and that was a big deal because they were saying, well, this is a big deal. So didn't you look for a tape of the first instance? And the FBI guy's like, uh, yeah, we and sure in the did. Other, in the other tape, there's nothing there. That's the one that Sean Hannity put on. Uh, right no, there's no no audio. That's right. But but um, what happened is, is that actually you've been to this location. I've been to this location. I kicked up. Actually, amazingly, you talk about peace, Sean. I was there giving the kickoff talk for that location when Black Lives Matter uh, came down the street because the Breonna Taylor verdict had been announced that night and there were a thousand, they just came right by. There was no problem left us alone. Like they had their protest and we had our, I don't call it protest, but standing up for salvation and life. And it was two different things. And it was amazing, right? We just came from San Francisco for the West coast walk for life, Sean. And there were like 10 or 20 people. And they just yelled at us like, go home pro-lifers. And, you know, of course they're used to protests every day. But the point is, is that on the first instance, Mark was down this block and across the street. And actually, he was trying to get uh, these uh, women to go to a pro-life pregnancy center. And this complainant ran up to him. Now, why wasn't he charged with interfering? That was actually about a pro-life pregnancy center. That was about getting non-abortion care. That was about getting reproductive rights care, right? That wasn't about yelling at somebody's kid or using the F-bomb or whatever happened on the second event. Like, where is all that? And that shows the, uh, the, the injustice of it all. That's why I said, if the law doesn't apply equally in every similar circumstance to everybody, and a hallmark of justice is that 
equally situated people or similarly situated people are treated similarly. And that's just not what's happening. That's why I called it weaponizing the law enforcement in the United States of America. Not I've got a question. I've got a question, which is as as the case went to jury, I think it was on that Friday, uh, you know, we we felt like this was a slam dunk case and we got to the end of the day Friday, no verdict. We get to Monday, we're half the way through the day Monday, and you start seeing on social media the people, this is a travesty. Why is it taking them so long? We're getting some emails from people who are getting worried about the deadlocked jury. And then my understanding is that uh, there was a juror who, for some reason, was removed from the jury. They put a new juror in that guy's place, and suddenly a half hour later, you've got a not guilty verdict. Uh, to me, I wasn't in the courtroom. I wasn't in the jury deliberations, but it seems to me, is is that a case? Is it is it too speculative, overly speculative to think that you maybe just had some sort of like one person on that jury who was a pro-abortion zealot? And when that conflict of interest was resolved, everybody else knew from, from square one that Mark was innocent? I got to tread a little lightly here, Steve, uh, but that's not what happened. You don't have to worry okay. about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the judge... Uh, uh, got a got a question that you know. Uh, uh, so what happens is you go back and there's 12 people, and then important cases there's alternates. And what they did was they handed up a note that said we're deadlocked. You don't know it could be one to 12 or 12. I mean, one to 11 or 11 to one or six to six. Uh, if anybody wants to see a great movie on this, um, an old movie. Oh gosh, what's the name we just talked about? 12, 12 Angry Men. Yeah, 12 Angry Men. <laughs> I want you to watch this because I don't want to have to do it again. Exactly. Great movie, and it's exactly and you, what You've happens. also mentioned uh, my cousin Vinny, respectfully, also. The defense is wrong. Are you sure? That is not exactly what happened. That is a better movie than 12 Angry Men, but not accurate. <laughs> 12 Angry Men is accurate. That's what goes on. And uh, you talk about a deadlock jury and how it goes. I've been the foreman of a jury uh, on a case that was originally deadlocked and went the other way after a couple of days. So you have to read all the jury instructions, evaluate all the evidence, and you have to take your time. But people get sick, Steve. Uh, they get they get a call that their kid is coming in um, from college because they have meningitis. and they need, You know, all sorts of things can happen. And that's why they have alternates. And what happened was, and you can read McMonahan's statement about what happened if you want to know what the what was allowed to be said from the judge. Uh, but that happened in, in chambers, and generally that's kept private. But basically, uh, they had to replace one of the jurors. And they did. And th that can be for a myriad of reasons. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think people need to worry that there was someone on one side or the other politically or not politically or that was like, I've known this guy my whole life and I don't like, you know, like, well, why didn't you tell him that? Because they go through a whole jury selection process called voir dire, uh, old French, uh, to tell the truth, uh, you know, to, to examine what people say about the truth. So, and uh, sometimes you miss or sometimes someone gets sick. I've had jurors that just couldn't look at the pictures. They thought they could. Mm. child abuse cases murder cases they just couldn't look at it couldn't so, look at it one time i'll tell you a funny story i had a case where with the marijuana dealers and they were in these four dudes had marijuana under the seats um four bricks of like a ton of marijuana tens of thousands and they and it was cold out and the windows were rolled up and they had the heat on and they claimed that they had borrowed the car and they didn't know the marijuana was under the seats even though they all had <laughs> Yeah, even though they all had like cash and baggies, little, yeah, and I was examining across the, and I was like, so you're a jeweler. And they're like, no, man, I'm not a jeweler. And I said, well, you had 150 little jeweler's bags in your pocket. And he goes, oh, uh, yeah, my aunt's a jeweler. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so what I did was, what I actually took the step instead of admitting the certificate of analysis to show that it was marijuana, I, I admitted the marijuana into evidence and I put the bags up on the jury rail. <laughs> <laughs> and after about 45 minutes, this juror raises her hand and the judge goes, ma'am, you, you're not allowed to ask questions. She goes, I got to tell you, judge, if Mr. Britton doesn't remove that marijuana, I can't be a juror anymore because it's stinging my eyes and it smells like crap. <laughs> <laughs> which is of course the whole reason that like right. four guys could drive around in a heated car with the windows up for 10 hours and not know oh, and you know that gosh. was the end of it and so yeah jurors can and i guess if i'd have said i'm not moving the dope judge she'd say well then i'm going home and the judge would have had to replace her there was no alternate in that case but there's a million reasons steve okay 
And I, for the speculators out there, the conspiracy theorists, don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. The uh, I knew we weren't going to get through this without a fun old uh, prosecutor story from Matt. So that was. And it idea. wasn't about someone I, who hurt children, Sean. No, I. It was not a child molester, but it was drugs. That would have been my second uh, guess. Um, they were convicted, by the way, less than okay. twenty minutes, Steve. Oh, good. One time, I got a note, guys, with a jury that came back. They had deliberated for twenty-eight minutes. And the note said, we just want the judge to know that for 20 of these minutes, we were looking for the bailiff. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It That's didn't take funny. us this long. Right. We, we, we're not that stupid. Yeah. Where is the bailiff? Um, okay. So as we close out, I think that the uh, big message on this as we head into the campaign is we need to go get them. We need to get out there in the grassroots. We need to sign up to pray freedom of speech one out. And I want each of you gentlemen just to share, you know, why this should be encouraging to people. It was outrageous. I know I went on my rant. I'll probably go on more rants of how outrageous it is as I put this in the back of my mind and we move forward. Um, but this was a huge victory and it could have been a huge loss. Um, but we won. We won big and you should have the confidence to go out and we're talking about those legalese because we have to. But in the end, we're using basic freedom of speech to reach out to women who feel they have no other option than to pay a doctor to kill their baby. And we are getting in the way of that by being a sign, a law abiding sign in the public right away, offering information and getting them real medical help. And we know that works. We know that's proven. And they know it. That's why they're coming after us, because the only way to get rid of 40 Days for Life is to get rid of free speech. And they are failing at that. And it's something we should be very grateful for. Well, I'll give Steve the last word, and I'll tell you the, what I think the importance is. Number one, God's in charge. We are for salvation, right? Everybody dies, but we are against the slaughter of the innocents, which we know was condemned in the Bible. And look what Herod did, right, going after our Lord, who was uh, fully God and fully man. And so we are, are standing in the breach, right? Volunteers out on the street with our families standing there, subjecting ourselves to the slings and arrows of being yelled at by like this complainant guy, but not supposedly the slings and arrows of being in the public square and peacefully and lawfully stating our opinion. And we are supposed to all, including the other side, the pro boards, to be able to do that free from fear of threat, intimidation, loss of freedom, life, and liberty. And that's not what happened in this case, but God is in charge. God loves life. It's the gospel of life. And the system did work. The, the, the men failed. The women failed. They chose to abuse the system to, to mark it up, no pun intended, so that Mark was arrested in an abusive and probably illegal way. And on certainly unnecessary way. But then he got a lawyer and then another lawyer. And then he got a local lawyer who knew what he was doing and it worked. And the jury was seated and it worked. And one of them had to go and it worked. And the judge allowed it to go to the jury and it worked. And Mark has no conviction. The gospel is, uh, you always point out in the pro-life says, our Lord says that we will be persecuted in his name. Not that we might be persecuted in his name. And when you put yourself out there, uh, something is going to happen somewhere. But 99.9 .9 of all the street corners I've been on, and you guys have been on ththousands, I've been on hundreds, uh, most of it's positive. And, you know, we have to go out there without fear. Fear is the tool of the devil. It leads to anxiety. It leads to inertia. And then it leads to despair. And that's what the devil wants. And Mark, through his courage and his bearing the cross, I think, has given us all the courage because we should be ashamed now if we're afraid to go out there. And the last message is don't snap. That's what they yeah. want. They want to yep. get shoved. They want to get smacked. You remember when the yep. Pope said, if you say something bad about my mother, you should expect a punch in the nose. Like, what's he talking about? Don't, don't do that. We are peaceful, prayerful, like among the many things, what's he talking about? But um, we're supposed to be peaceful, prayerful, and loving, right? Turn the other cheek. You know, we either proclaim the gospel or we don't. On the other hand, you need to protect yourself from real threats. Move away to safety. Call 911 and call us. We got your back, right, Steve? Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, 
you you talked earlier about how the FBI sort of created its own emergency situation by storming the guy's house when there was no need to do so. I think that's the same principle. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's the same advice that we give to our leaders when we train them. We say, don't create your own emergency. And so if someone's getting in your face and you're, you know, there's kind of that inclination, I'm not giving an inch, I'm going to go toe to toe. And, you know, you've, you're, it's like the baseball player and the umpire when they're arguing the balls and strikes and they're, they're right up in each other's face. All it takes is for somebody to like bump you slightly, a slight graze of the shoulder, or, you know, you accidentally spit as you're speaking. Uh, that's that's where you get the FBI showing up at your door. So don't let anything escalate. I think that's excellent advice. Don't create your own opportunity for the FBI to come knocking on your door. We think that this is going to chill the FBI, as you said, Matt, but we don't want to tempt fate. We don't want to create opportunities for them. We don't want to create our own emergencies. And, as and far don't as my- fear law enforcement. I said I'd give you the last word, but uh, you know, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. so and, and, Oh, I'm uh, not done and- yet. Yeah, I know. I know. But don't, but, but don't fear law enforcement. You know, Sean brings this point out. I mean, I was, I retired from law enforcement. I love law enforcement, but they're supposed to enforce the law, not make up the law and not enforce the not law. And they're not supposed to enforce the law inequally. My point is tell the sheriff that you're there, tell the constable, tell the chief of police or the sergeant or that, that walks the beat that you're there, show them our statement of peace. Tell them that we have an emergency operations plan. Tell them that we have commandments of safety. Tell them that we have almost 100% perfect record of law abiding, no violence, except for violence committed again. Help invite them out there. Tell them that we, to, to watch, to participate and show, and they'll see who holds the truth. They'll see who acts in charity. They will see who is peaceful loving and lawful and they'll see who's yelling and dropping the f-bombs with half their head shaved dressed as a big whatever it ain't us we are the ones who hold the truth and we hold love and they'll see that and sometimes we make mistakes and mistakes should not send people you know that's why like a car accident you don't go to jail it's called an accident (laughs) you know but they're they're looking for a reason and this is from the beginning of 40 Days for Life, because 40 Days for Life was not what it is now. It was, everybody was skeptical of it. We we're coming off the 1990s where abortion doctors were shot, where clinics were bombed. And now we're like, hey, we're going to get thousands of people and go outside abortion clinics all night for 40 straight days. And people looked at us like we were nuts. And it took a long, long time in those early years, it took about, I'd say, four or five years to really establish ourselves as peaceful. And now we have that reputation. And when that nut shot up that Planned Parenthood in 2015 in in Colorado Springs, it was the Washington Post that said, well, we know this isn't 40 Days for Life because they have a proven track record of being peaceful and law-abiding. We didn't even have to defend ourselves. So it's, you know, the ad is what the FBI is going against. And that's one of the many reasons I'm glad they got their clock cleaned in this case they deserved it and i hope he sues and i hope he wins and as steve you mentioned you know we need to go back out there but we can't give them a reason because they're looking for one and i think they'll kind of go away i do think it'll be similar to the irs thing where they'll maybe cut it out for a time period but we have to see that play out (laughs) it actually has to happen i don't want to say that and then in two weeks you know (laughs) i get arrested when i'm you know going into chick-fil-a And I think, I guess my parting message to everybody who participates in 40 Days for Life is that even though it doesn't feel like it when there's guns drawn, SWAT team guys showing up at Mark's door, but this is the greatest compliment that the president, the Department of Justice, the FBI, they don't mess with 40 Days for Life if it doesn't work. Matt just mentioned how between the three of us, we've been to thousands of 40 Days for Life vigils. I've been to them all over North America. You guys have been to them all around the world. And Ultimately, we've all heard people say the same thing, like, look, I know what you're going to say, but does it really work? Does this, I've never seen the worker quit. I've never even been there when a baby's been saved. Does it really make a difference? And if we ever doubt whether our impact makes a difference, know that the Biden DOJ and the Biden FBI, they know very well that it makes a difference. Otherwise, there's no use sending a couple dozen SWAT team officers out to Mark's house and and trying to scare the living daylights out of every pro-lifer. I think that this should make us very confident that whether we see it or not, what does our Lord say? Blessed are those who have not seen, but who have believed. You're saving lives, even if you don't verify it in any given hour out at the vigil. It's so true. Yeah, when you can't win fair and square, send the SWAT team at night. (laughs) Yeah. And it is a huge compliment. That's very well put. 
and it should motivate us. So go to 40daysforlife.com, find one of the hundreds of locations uh, where we'll be holding peaceful vigils, law-abiding peaceful vigils, starting on February the 22nd. And also pray for our uh, leaders throughout Europe and Africa. We will be holding a, a training uh, in Krakow, Poland uh, later this week. So please pray for that event. Pray for us. Uh, 40 Days for Life is exploding uh, throughout Europe and Africa and certainly in Latin America, which we've talked a lot about. So uh, keep us in prayer. The world is looking to the United States and they should because we are winning and we are ending abortion at the local level. So be part of it starting on February the 22nd. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Steve. Be sure to rate, review, share this podcast, and continue to give us great comments and criticism in on the YouTube page uh, in the comment section. So uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you, and God bless you.